much, Jason and Susan. I was so excited for this launching of uh, Web 3.0 Research Center and looking forward to more success and growth with the center going forward in 2023. Let's welcome our first speaker, Mr. Peter Voss, for his sharing. talk about uh, today is um, statistical systems which are all the rage now um, there's obviously a lot of excitement about that but I want to talk about the, the strength and the weaknesses uh, of this technology and uh, also talk about an alternative uh, approach uh, that can address some of the uh, limitations of this technology now I think probably all of you have um, followed or have been exposed to chat GPT. It really is quite a breakthrough. It's quite, quite amazing of what it can do. Um, you know, you can ask it to write a poem in, in, um, in, in the style of um, Bob Dylan, you know, to tell you about the strengths and weaknesses of Elon Musk or whatever, you know, you, whatever you might think of. So it's, it's very creative in uh, in coming up with a new, very plausible kind of uh, dialogue or, or, or um, text. But I, th I think what has also become clear that it can also be extremely misleading. So, you know, somebody actually asked, hey, can you put up a report for me of what work I've been doing for the last three days for my boss? Because I actually didn't do any work, but, you know, hey, can you make up some stuff? and in, include some code snippets to, to show the code that I wrote. And it, it did that quite convincingly, so if your boss isn't really uh, up, to, up to snuff, then you know, it would say, oh, okay, great, uh, you know, good, good work, you know, get a promotion. So, uh, yeah, uh, the, the technology makes up stuff. And so some people have, have called this technology a stochastic parrot. Why, why do they do that? So, Essentially, this technology, GPT-3 and, and chat uh, GPT, are, are really based on masses and masses amounts of information, uh, uh, billions of, of words that have been uh, uh, used to train a model, a statistical model, that really just embeds the correlations. Now, what is so amazing, though, is how this, how this just taking statistics, essentially, in, in some kind of a clever way, can produce such, you know, such good text and such good uh, conversations, but it is ultimately statistics. Now, uh, ChatGPT uh, has, in addition to it, used um, reinforcement learning to kind of coax the system into producing uh, conversations that, that seem more plausible. So there were humans in the loop to basically uh, train, train the system. Uh, but it, it really is quite amazing of, uh, of what people have achieved with that. Now, getting to commercial applications, which is you know, the, the area that I'm involved with, is can these large language models actually handle con uh, commercial conversations? Are they up, up to that? And uh, to analyze it, I've asked some questions. What are the requirements, what are the essential requirements for a commercial, uh, a business grade say, contact center interaction. And uh, so there's a list here of, of the kinds of things. And the first two items, I'll, I'll kind of skip by them because it's, it's, a, it's a little bit controversial in terms of what understanding, or what depth of understanding, what level of understanding um, these, uh, these large language models have. So I don't want to really go there. So they clearly have some level of understanding but is it really genuine understanding, deep understanding? And then also, to what extent they can reason and give a reasoned contextual response. Sometimes they seem to do 
really pretty damn well, you know, surprisingly good. So I'll skip past those two questions and get to things that, that really are, uh, you know, definite limitations and shortcomings when it comes to commercial, robust commercial applications. So the first one is you really, really want predictable responses. You know, as we talk to our enterprise customers, they say, you know, if we have a, a, a chatbot or an IVR, the system needs to be signed off by legal, legally to be happy that what the system tells you is actually, you know, fits into the legal requirements. Uh, you need sign off um, by your marketing department, you need sign off by your quality assurance department. So you really need the system to be predictable. You don't want it to just make up stuff that will get, get you into trouble in, in an enterprise. So that's one of the limitations of large language models at the moment is they make up stuff. You need real-time operation and you need real-time information. You need to be in, in interfaced, integrated with a bunch of APIs, different data sources that need to bring in that information and integrate it into your call model, into your conversational uh, engine. And uh, again, large language models are trained in batch. They take, cost millions of dollars to train, takes a long time to train them. You, you, they're really not designed to have integrated real-time information I inserted in there in, in, the, in the right way. Uh, so it's, it's the integration of real-time data that's kind of the, the, the problem, but it's a real requirement. Then custom knowledge, so you each enterprise have their own business rules, their own you know, product information and so on. So you need that custom information. And again, it needs to be deeply integrated into your, your call it language model, into whatever your language engine is. So it's all about the quality of the data, not the quantity of training data. The quality is important. So, you know, in an enterprise, they're not going to be interested in your chatbot being able to tell the user what the population of Timbuktu is, or what the pecking order is of Roman emperors, or, you know, what the Latin name for frog's tonsils are, or whatever, you know. It's you, you, you're really just interested in having accurate information that the enterprise, that's relevant to the enterprise. Uh, next, next is, uh, action sequences, uh, and they need to be, again, contextual to who are you talking to, what have you said before, what do they know, what is the problem they're dealing with, what data do you have about them, and so on. So contextual interaction and troubleshooting. So for example, if you a Comcast or something and you want to help people troubleshoot their Wi-Fi, you know, do you know, have, have you already asked them to try and move their router into the kitchen? whatever suggestion you might have. So that troubleshooting exercise needs to be customized uh, to, to the, the current situation at, at hand, or if it's a medical diagnosis, or you know, what, what, whatever you're trying to achieve. Uh, on the other hand, you also need to, uh, the system needs to execute very carefully designed steps to update APIs to make things happen, to handle a payment, or to place an order, to cancel an order, whatever it might, might be. So again, that needs to be done very accurately contextually. You need to be able to learn rapidly new information. As your customer, the person interacting with it, gives you new information, again, whether it's medical information, financial information, or about shopping, or troubleshooting, and that information needs to be integrated into that model and be available for reasoning, for conversation, for context. Um, the, the, the second part of this rapid learning is that things change in the enterprise. Uh, enterprise introduce new products, you know, they have, may have seasonal discounts, specials, business rules change. These need to be able to be integrated into the, into the, deeply integrated into the model of responses and reasoning and, and so on. Now, um, lastly, we have the issue of scrutable, the, system, the model being scrutable. Um, large language models and generally statistic, uh, statistical systems 
are not scrutable. They are black boxes. So you can't really audit them. You don't know why they're giving a certain response. And that's a huge problem. And in fact, in, in Europe, uh, sort of driven by Europe, there's a big move to actually disallow models that are not scrutable. They cannot explain how they came to certain conclusions. You obviously have the issue of bias, you know, if, if uh, that, that's kind of a separate I I issue, but uh, related is if the system doesn't give you the response you expect it to, what do you do? You know, in large language models, statistical models, really the only remedy is uh, to throw more training data at it and, you know, hope that will solve the problem without having catastrophic forgetting, without breaking a lot of other things. So, um, having you know, having a black box system is, is, is a real problem, but from an audit point of view and from a, a troubleshooting, debugging, fixing uh, point of view. So, if large language models, statistical models can't meet these enterprise requirements, then what can? What is, uh, what is a, a, a good approach? So, our experience over the last 15 plus years has been that if you use a, a knowledge graph based cognitive architecture designed in the right way, you can achieve these objectives and have an intelligent conversation. Now, uh, I'd like to actually uh, demonstrate this with a practical example. One of our customers is the 1-800-Flowers uh, group of companies, actually a group of companies, uh, Harry and David, and Popcorn Factory and so on. And we developed a, a system for them that has a high level of sophistication in this conversation. They can learn interactively and, and so on uh, using, uh, using this approach. Uh, so uh, this is a, a, a web-based chat chatbot. In this case, uh, we're demonstrating some of the uh, capabilities in a, in a, sales, um, a, a sales scenario. I'm already logged in to my 1-800-Flowers account, so I go will greet me and look up all of my user information and orders. Can I get a status update on the order from my mom, Elizabeth Lee? I will now look up my order, but will also learn that my mother is Elizabeth Lee. Where is my other order? It's for my sister, Elizabeth Payton. I go gives me the status for my sister's order and also learns that my sister is Elizabeth Payton. What is the gift message on my order for Elizabeth? I didn't specify which Elizabeth I was talking about, and since both are in context, Igo asks a disambiguation question. We can apply short-term memory by answering with, my sister. Yes, I want to send her a birthday gift. Igo already knows an address for my sister and asks if that's the correct address. In this case, I want to send it to a different address. No, her work address is 8369 Beverly Boulevard, Los Angeles. At no point is a user forced into making a list picker selection. Instead, they can use natural language, for example. Just a small one. I can go back to any part of the conversation. Go back to the size options. And I will allow me to make a change without starting the entire process over again. I'll upgrade to the large one. 585-458-9960. At this point, we finished the full sales flow, and IGO now takes us to the checkout page to confirm the information and take payment. Now let's time travel to a year in the future. Hi, I need to get a gift for my sister. With long-term memory, Igo remembers who my sister is and what addresses she has. I can select an address from the list or just use natural language. Use her work address. Igo reminds me that I sent her a gift last year and I think I want to send her the same item. She loved what I got for her last year. Can you send her the same item? Igo selects the same delivery date as last year 
and remembers my sister's phone number so won't ask for it again like in the previous example. Wishing you a happy birthday. Looks correct. Igo has selected the same product as last time, used the same delivery date for this year, has used her work address, and has the correct gift message. So th this is an actual application and, you know, that is, is running and so we're showing here the as different divisions of the company were added, you know, how the statistics improved on it. So um, what I'd like to talk a little bit more about is the actual architecture and the approach. So the general approach is that you have a cognitive architecture that in, incorporates all of the key requirements of an intelligent system such as deep understanding, contextual understanding, short-term memory, long-term memory, reasoning, uh, natural language generation, and, and so on. And they're all deeply integrated with each other to achieve this, this kind of uh, capability. And so the idea here is that you have a hyper-personalized uh, brain, personal assistant uh, type of thing that could you know, in this case, it's controlled and owned by the company, by the enterprise. But of course, it could also be a personal assistant that you own, ultimately. Uh, but it remembers your, your conversations, your prior conversations. Uh, so, independent from whatever information might be stored in the enterprise database, the system is much more flexible in that it actually remembers conversations and little details that you may have given along the way that your enterprise database may not, may not, uh, you know, may not be practical to, to, to store it there. Um, so the, the architecture is essentially kind of a three-level architecture uh, of, of the knowledge graph. There's a central part, the central brain, uh, which has all the common knowledge required for conversation, common sense knowledge about relationships, how to start a conversation, you know, just general information required to be able to have uh, intelligent conversations. Then the blue ring that you see there is basically the, the information required for a particular enterprise. Uh, this is also where the APIs are connected to get real-time information, to get information, send information. So the blue layer is the custom layer for the enterprise with their business rules and, and special product ontologies and so on. And then the outer layer, the green layer here, is the customer-specific information, what you've learned from the customer and interacting with them. Uh, now these are just logically separated and you know, they are totally seamlessly integrated to, to, to work, work together. So th th this approach really is very, very different from the statistical learning approach that, that is so prevalent uh, right now um, in people basically taking a lot of data, tagging it, uh, getting and, and uh, basically training a model to, to just categorize the intents um, you know, as you would have on uh, Alexa or Siri or, or so on. And then there's kind of some simple, relatively simple flowchart program that will execute whatever you want. You know, give me the weather and it'll go through that. Or, you know, give me Uber and it'll ask you, well, where do you want to go? How many people are going? So that's the, the really what pretty much everybody else is doing without a brain, without a cognitive architecture. And it, it has all of these disadvantages. So they really, we believe there really is a fundamentally different approach. It's not a matter of just, you know, making bigger candles. It's really, we, we need to move to the light bulb. Now, to, uh, to, to, to finish off, I just want to, um, you know, talk about what, you know, what do industry leaders say about that? Uh, there, there clearly is a lot of value in these statistical systems, but we need to know what the right applications are. So, you know, here we have Dennis Savis, the, um, the, the, the founder of um, Google DeepMind, and it's quite remarkable 
that you know his company has hundreds of PhD level people working on machine learning, deep learning, and yet here's the statement: deep learning is an amazing technology. Yes, we agree, but definitely not enough to solve AI or AGI, artificial general intelligence, the kind of intelligence we ultimately want and need, not by a long shot. So. Let's also kind of revisit what, what is state of the art uh, of the large companies working on that. We have Siri from Apple that's now, I think, 10 years old. Uh, it really hasn't at all lived up to its promise and, and what the, the founders of, of Siri had envisaged of having a personal assistant that really gets to, to know you and can help, help you with stuff. It's really stagnated. Let's take a look at Amazon Alexa. Uh, they just announced that the 10,000 people they've had working on it, they are making massive cuts on it. They're losing $10 billion this year on, on, on Alexa. They're basically pretty much giving up on it because they don't have the kind of engagement that they expected. Yes, people use it to play music um, and set reminders, you know, but not much beyond that because of the technical limitations, uh, the lack of intelligence, the lack of learning, understanding, and, and so on. Google Duplex was promoted with you know, a lot of fanfare about four years ago. Um, nowhere to be seen, you know, basically it doesn't really work. Uh, Tesla full self-driving. Now, this is an area where deep learning, machine learning, statistical systems have really made a big difference. I, I drive a Tesla, and you know some of some of the capabilities of it are, are, are really quite remarkable in terms of how image, how accurate image recognition has become, and what they can do with it. But to get uh, to get the Tesla system to work as well as it does, they also added one and a half million lines of code. So it's not just statistical systems. The statistical systems, to get them to work, they actually need to be part of a bigger framework where the, the decision making and, and reasoning is actually in code. Um, now I'll also say, yeah, I, I think uh, the, the Tesla is fantastic, but full self-driving, I believe, is many years away. There are just way too many edge cases, there really is the common sense reasoning that the system has, and you're not going to put your child in a car without a driver uh, and, and let the car drive it across, across town to the other side of town uh, until it's extremely reliable. You, you can't just have, oh, okay, didn't know what to do, you know, once in a hundred miles or something. Well, that's not, that's not good enough. Uh, it's just a really, really hard problem, and statistical systems by themselves cannot solve that. Now, lastly, we have, you know, from OpenAI, I mean, they've been amazing in, in the technology that they've pushed out, GPT-3, um, now ChatGPT, uh, DALL-E, and Whisper. Now, DALL-E is a generative uh, system that can actually create new images from text input. That's pretty amazing, and I think it's useful, you know, for a, a, a great number of things uh, to to create, uh, it, you know, professional-looking images from from text. Now, Whisper, you, not everybody here may know what that is, but they just uh, a few months ago released a speech a new speech recognition model called Whisper, and it really is quite remarkable. It's really good, and it's one of the areas where statistical systems really shine. You know, they, they, they really are good. Now, they still have the problem that these statistical systems also do not really have common sense and adapt to things, so they will still output, you know, statistical likelihoods of what they thought they heard. They can't really apply common sense to uh, what you think you, you heard or tune it to the context that you are currently in. But still, uh, it, 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 it works remarkably well. So, finally, just, uh, you know, from the CEO of uh, OpenAI, GPT is incredibly limited, is 
incredibly limited but good enough at some things to create a misleading impression of greatness. Now that's from, from him. So there's a lot of work to be done according, according to them. And I believe it needs to move away from statistical systems and incorporate um, cognitive architectures. And then I actually asked ChatGPT whether it thought it was up to the task of uh, commercial chatbot, uh, commercial operation, and it didn't really think so. All right, that's all I have. So I, I think I have a few minutes for, for questions. Are there any questions? Come on, somebody must have a question. Two. There's one. problem in like personal information. I could say anybody is my brother, father, whatever. How are you going to implement protections against that? Well, uh, yeah, that's a good question. Obviously, every system has to be uh, tuned. And this is the, the business rules that I'm talking about that you implement. So for every application, you have to give the constraints, which again, in a, you know, in a large language model type approach or a statistical approach, uh, is, is really not possible to, to define those kind of business rules or constraints of what can you do, can't you do. So, for example, one, one of the things that um, I didn't get a chance to talk about, but our ideal, and this I think fits, fits in very well with the whole Web3 kind of scenario, is something we call a personal, personal assistant. Um, now, it should really be called a personal, personal, personal assistant, uh, because there are three different meanings of the word personal that I think are important. Ideally, what you want is you want a personal assistant that is personal in the sense that you own it, not some mega corporation. It serves your agenda, not some uh, mega corporation's agenda. So that's the first personal. The second personal, that it's hyper personalized to you. You know, you're not a demographic, you're not a statistic, you are an individual, and it knows your preference, your history, and so on. And that leads me to the, to the third personal, which is the privacy issue, that certain things are personal to you, you want to keep them personal. So you, you would basically tell your system, your personal personal assistant, what it can share with whom. There are certain things you, you know, you freely share with your, your spouse, there are other things that you want to share with your business partner maybe, or you know, just random individuals or companies. So it, it's then like, like having a, a, you know, a human secretary that knows exactly what you can share with whom. So the technology that we have, the cognitive architecture technology, allows you to do that, that it can, it can learn interactively. You can either predefine them with your company and say, these, these are the privacy rules that we have. These are things you can share, those are things you can't share. Or it can be at the personal level uh, that the individual can, can define. And thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, uh, firstly, I want to say just for my career, uh, I'm helping my customers on the recruiting side, also on the human resources management consulting. So uh, we have a lot of services called like uh, SARS, right? But now we have a new Chinese AI so, uh, as a service. So is there any like new uh, like technique you can share? So how those a company can use AI towards their human resources management and also on the recruiting and also the, for the people intelligence management. So, because I'm not on the tech side, so I'm come here to learn because we're looking for a lot of good platform or tools for our customers or for ourselves for improve our efficiency to how to find the right person and management the uh, right uh, people for the right positions. Thank you. 
must say I struggle to hear the, the acoustics here are really quite bad. I, I don't know if you could maybe summarize the question. So my question is how, to, how the AI technique to affect the human resources and also the uh, job hunting uh, efficient for now, for, for people not on the tech side. Is there any like, technique or any platform we can, we can use now? Um, okay, are you, are you asking about our system or whether there's a, a platform you could use? Um, so the, um, the technology that I'm talking about, and I'm not, uh, I'm not quite sure if that answers your question, but the technology I'm talking about as a cognitive architecture, almost nobody else is currently working on that because everybody's got so swept up in deep learning, machine learning, statistical systems. The big companies all have a lot of data, they have a lot of processing power, so that's the hammer that got so everything looks like a nail. And so, unfortunately, there is very little development happening in sort of cognitive architecture that will ultimately lead us to, to real AGI. And, you know, we are leading, leading the way, but there's really very little um, information of, uh, available. But certainly, you could talk to me and give you a, a, a bit more information. I think we've just run out of time. So, thank you. Thank you, Peter.